Hello everyone, today we make the second part on the video about medieval Verona for our European Historical Regions series. And we left from the rise of Frederick II of Hohenstaufen, at least as King of Sicily to make it overlap with the chronology that he was crowned in Palermo in 1201. Uh, and as we've seen in the previous video, Verona had always maintained important ties with the German monarchy, had fundamentally supported imperial policy up until at least uh, Frederick Barbarossa enforced, you know, a harsher policy uh, in the Po Valley, in which Verona had, as we've seen, a dramatic strategic uh, role, because it controlled de facto the uh, the Adige Valley and thus the best connection between Italy and Germany through the Brenner Pass. Uh, we've seen how the Veronese were able to blockade uh, the, uh, the the valley in fact and even obliging the imperial armies taking other routes and so on. And this as we've seen occurred mostly for the uh, autonomistic um, Pulsions that the Italian communes had started developing and together with their political and social expansion and also military one as we've seen the Veronese participated even to the Battle of Legnano and other crucial military um, exploit of the Lombard League and th thus securing an important control also over the surrounding uh, district which as we've seen, was completely new in the empire and it would remain essentially the prerogative just of the Italian city-states in medieval times because elsewhere uh, the countryside was fundamentally dominated by the nobility. This even though northeastern Italy was much more of a feudal land than the rest of the Italic kingdom, um, objectively not enough to prevent the development and as the, the Veronese case, um, as we've seen, proves expanding also on the, on the rural um, aristocracy, uh, but at the same time enough to maintain some important connections and uh, kind of um, benefits deriving from the, the, the maintaining of a sort of feudal uh, loyalty, right? And we have already seen how during the third quarter of the 10th century, the same Veronese mark had been fundamentally incorporated in Bavaria, right? The two countries remaining somehow distant, but still this idea that the Northeast could more easily permeable from Germany and it could even be brought, even at some point um, during late medieval times, as sort of uh, kind of German dependency, like a, a sort of another land. Um, of uh, of the Germanic kingdom rather than uh, part of the Italic one it's, it's something that remains strong. We've seen it for Friuli, um, video that we made some months ago, um, and uh, that is kind of the most extreme case because in in that place we're talking really of an important feudal preeminence, an important even Germanization by some degree of still, however, a core essentially Italian. Um, background. Um, but in the case of Verona this took a very important form especially during the 13th and the 14th century so uh, essentially in, in a moment in which the the German monarchy had still the possibility of waging war in Italy but growing ever more, de more dependent literally as a monarchy uh, to core on the same Italian vassals support also in Germany, and that um, Verona exploited, in fact, as a dynamic, uh, magnificently to the benefit of the local seigniory at the end of the day. And this seigniory starts essentially in the 13th century, the way of which was paved by the Daromano Ezzelin dynasty, which, as we've seen, stemmed essentially as a uh, as a clanic force as a as a f as a political faction among the uh, the many uh, from the houses that uh, held power 
in the city and in the countryside, already in a phase effect of communal struggle properly. But that in the Veronese role in the empire, however, as the city had been provided already with um, an imperial vicariate at different times, exactly for securing the, again, the, the, the crossing in the peninsula from, from Germany by, by the emperors, had surely given the Veronese government kind of more vertical outlook, right? Because the imperial bakery would uh, keep, as you will see now, being used uh, essentially to also compact, uh, to, to co-opt also a certain power in the city that could be, um, could have a dialogue with, in fact, imperial authority as a sort of, in fact, a vassal, something different, technically. But it still gets down to creating kind of a more, um, at least tendentially, monarchic direction, which in some ways the, the Italian lordships at the end of the day uh, will take. And especially in northern Italy, because um, in this area the, the, the people ever hardly took power in, a, in an absolute way, right? Uh, because society was um, more stratified since an earlier time. This is different from Tuscany, for example, that somehow maintained a more repub a Republican um, face, even though, you know, even to approximate on the pattern, Lombardy Tuscany is not entirely correct, just just tendentially so. And as we were saying before, especially the the Veronese mark had historically been bit slightly more of a feudal land than others. Having said this, of course, Verona was a full commune, right? Even compared to other um, to other polis, actually was one of the most powerful in, in Italy, so it's still the product of that kind of civic, urban, um, in fact, communal uh, identity, political, institutional culture, and there is no um, ambiguity regarding this, and this did help, in fact, also the scenery, because as we will see now, it's the same communal uh, offices that accepted and structured themselves a, a seigneurial uh, establishment. What is worth mentioning, of course, is also the kind of super city government that started forming over, in fact, multiple centers, especially starting, in fact, from the Po Valley, um, that had, as we've seen, through the Lombard League, and so this common political and military practice, already um, a tradition of um, connection, of coordination, and that entailed the um, the appointment, in fact, of certain communal officials from city to city, mostly the Podestas, that were quite powerful individuals, uh, which is how the um, Hetzelins started, also from Verona, and how they attracted um, the attention of the same Frederick II. Starting from the 1200s, the Hetzelins gained a considerable amount of power um, in the city. First with uh, Etzelin II, known as the monk, who became Podesta of the same Verona. And it could perfectly happen that just uh, uh, someone from the same city could be, could be her own Podesta, as a matter of fact. And later with his son Etzelin III, about which uh, a very dark uh, legend has been fabricated, but as, as we will see, for specific political reasons uh, involving the bitter struggle between Guelphs and Ghibellines. Um, the Etzelins were originally Guelph, right, but they would become actually the champions of Ghibellinism later on for political convenience and that cooptation from the side of Frederick II that we will talk about. Um, and this Guelph allegiance is, is important because um, these are the same years, of also of the Second Lombard League, so of the wars between Frederick II and the Lombard city-states. So th the fact that Hetzelin, as an important um, lord of different Pau Valley cities, as he was called to perform, again, as a normal, within the that, that, that frame of institutional frame we just discussed, right, that there were different titles, not quite lord per se, but still the fact that he was being entrusted military power, right, mostly commanding 
the city army while respecting the rights, the statutes of the local commune, right, and coordinating them, again, multiple cities at, at once, an effort that was taking an ever more uh, international shape, by the way, because the Guelph and Ghibelline parts were coalescing just at that point. I made a video last spring that discusses a bit the political, social intersections of these parts together with the factions and so on. So it's never so uh, intuitive as the same case of the Ezzelins actually show because they fundamentally uh, change side accordingly. But th this has also to do, of course, with the... Uh, like, there is no such thing like a, a single city policy or just, again, a single part policy. There are always multiple factions, currents, influences uh, from the local to the kind of city level to the to the regional one to the international one and more because there are universal powers um, etc et so it's a huge mess as we have already seen actually in the Italian communes series. In 1206 the mayor of Verona, Azzano of Este, tried unsuccessfully to get rid of the Montecchi and San Bonifacio clans from the city. This, as we've seen, were historically the most powerful. In Verona, together with others, already the uh, Scaligers were there, the Ezzelins, as we've seen, too, and they were also intermarrying, as we will see. Um, and uh, Azzano allied himself with the Guelphs of the Veronese countryside, uh, whom he allowed to invade the city and destroy the palaces of the Ghibelline families. This practice started to be sadly common in late communal Italy as fundamentally these enormous mm, households, very often fortified, so literally threatened with towers, catapults, uh, barricades, serrails, uh, blockades and so on, the, the city, uh, the city space were First of all, also loaded in resources, all these clans were invested in dramatically remunerative commercial activities. Verona had important textile industries and, and more. Um, they had um, arsenals in them. So as soon as you managed fundamentally to exile these families, uh, that would still, however, occupy the uh, parts of the countryside as exiles so would be welcomed by neighboring city-states that were against you, uh, you would essentially uh, raise their their houses, uh, the, you would seize uh, their goods, you would have uh, kept persecuting also the the clients, the also part of the family members that had remained in the city to prevent these families to regain power. However, a part of the Ghibellines managed to escape with the help of Hetzelin II, the monk. So already here you see that there is traditionally Guelph background, this still his um, leaning towards the, the new opportunity, because if you naturally create this great fracture within the city, it would be huge um, moral strains attached, and and you could capitalize on, let's say, the, the, this force to support your side from within the establishment, right? Hetzel in the second, in fact, gathers an army in Bassano and heads towards Verona. Also, Azzano of Este gathers troops, but he is defeated in battle by Hetzel in the second and forced to flee, while the Ghibelline Odoric Visconti is elected Podesta of Verona in the process, right? So this regime toppling is, again, incredibly typical of the age. The Ghibelline Reformation was celebrated as an important victory. The um, Festival of the People was announced in the, in the process. It's on this occasion that the Palio of Verona originated. This was essentially a, a broader celebration in which some paramilitary games were performed, right? This time, actually, um, you have to imagine the city being still ruled largely by 
military clans that uh, were pretty uh, competitive as we've seen with each other they practice uh, knightly chivalric um, endeavors with enormous um, aggressiveness uh, Verona as we will see was uh, an important artistic center in which we know all the um, the French uh, literature was inflaming the, the fantasies of the young nobleman that again also bonded in this sort of uh, in fact military brotherhoods that were named after I don't know uh, certain figures say of the Arthurian cycle or even with some kind of beast warrior symbology that as we have seen in the previous video was deeply rooted uh, in Verona since longer times that, that would be taken up uh, again by the same scholars as we'll see in a while um, and there were some games uh, mostly quintains uh, tournaments of some sort and and also the people participated because they had some paramilitary ways of um, you know showing off that in Verona as we, we have seen in the portal of the Cathedral of Saint Zeno uh, were portrayed as challenging um, the the same milites right with the saint in between that somehow brings the order the concord of the commune but during the 13th century uh, Italian infantries were rising to pretty high that they already were since the previous one and even the ones before but were increasing their capacity their their size their their collective training their proving also their armament right challenging cavalry ever more directly so remember it's in this context that also the wars against the imperial army are fought and there the German cavalry was reaching some very high standards and the, the fact that it would be infantries from commoners even more that could challenge it was, was an enormous pride even of arguably that the militas were leading these men in battles as cavalry was at this point still the size of ultimately but the combined arm tactics were growing uh, in the Pau Valley especially at this point in an ever more uh, effective way to counter that the dominance so it was a struggle naturally about the, between the nobility and the people of some sort however also with a bit less tension than other cities because again the, the feudal element remained somehow more preeminent socially politically um, and Dante also speaks of the Palio of Verona in the Inferno 15122, which is fascinating because uh, that canticle, as you know, is full of references to war. Also, it's more concrete, material, brutal, bloody elements, as the uh, setting uh, would suggest. But Dante, as we will see, would uh, would live in Verona. And I made. Um, uh, a series, as you know, last year um, on the 700th anniversaries of Dante's death that uh, illustrates also that context if you are interested. In 1223, the III married Gilles of San Bonifacio, while his sister Cunizza da Romano married uh, Richard of uh, San Bonifacio, apparently linking the two important families. This produced as you realize that kind of also apparent Guelph Ghibelline um, coalition or intertwinement that still embodied fundamentally two powerful houses of the city that were coexisting as we've seen um, one had saved the political future of the other um, but for this very reason there were still two contendants in some way in fact uh, in, in the same 1223, um, Hazelin III's uh, father left him power over Verona, and the San Bonifacios didn't uh, agree on this passage of power and this somehow blessing to the to what appeared to be a kind of also more unitary direction from the side of the Esselins in their uh, rule over the city, which caused even Hetzelin III to repudiate his wife, so of, of the, uh, the other clan, 
and even advancing with an army towards Verona that brought, after a brief resistance, the Welfs to flee. And it's worth noticing that the shift towards a Ghibelline position now was evident from the side of the De Romanov, who uh, had de facto mm, ousted the same Guelph establishment that had somehow uh, been their, their original one as well. For this reason, the Guelph leaders met in Villa Franca to reestablish even the Lombard League as a response to the Azzeline lordship in Verona, but uh, there were not the political or military preconditions to carry out the struggle against the city. Um, on the contrary, Azzeline proved to be a competent leader who worked to strengthen the city power. Uh, for example, he had the first Veronese statue written, which is preserved today still uh, in the Capitulary Library of Verona. Um, and this had properly enfor been for enforced by the Podesta, so there is an important communal affirmation at this point. That the, that, that's the moment in which the, the Italian communes transform into proper states, or at least they, they begin, right? There is a, a tight control now that the central institution starts having properly on the regulation of the city district. Um, and this is, in fact, a, a dangerous moment, as we will see, because um, it, it, it was defining who would stay in charge of, uh, in fact, of a political institutional system that was unprecedented in, in power, right? Um, and at first, the Aceline Regency, we can call it, or Lordship, if you prefer, of the city, that kept, of course, working with its own communal institutions and, and so on, was peaceful. But after persistent attempts of the Guelph to carry out a coup of some sort, Aceline imprisoned numerous uh, political opponents uh, in, in the city, mostly, and... The, here, say, the, the Black Legion of Azzeline really uh, begins, and most of this is attributable to the um, pre-humanistic work of the uh, Paduan, in fact, chronicler uh, Albertino Mussato, who um, was essentially a hardcore Guelph and a Paduan as well. It's worth noticing that Azzeline himself was born in Padua, and so how after all, close, um, and the, the same people, these, these various communes really were, but um, Musato is from somehow later times, from the end of the 13th, the beginning of the 14th century, um, in, in a phase in which, as we will see now, Verona and Padua had been fighting bitter wars, um, Padua embodied Guelphism, Verona, Ghibellinism, and uh, the 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 level of um, of of military escalation and political conflict uh, in Musato's time was 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 unprecedented, right? So um, the again the the Dark Legion that had spread among the Guelph exiles and so on against Ezlin was very strong, but historiographically today we uh, assess that Ezlin was not just um, a uh, capable ruler, but that also his acts of violence and repression were essentially not different from the ones used in Italy and in the world more broadly at the time, right? On the contrary, he pur pursued relentlessly a political project that was shrewd shrewdly carried out through... Um, in fact, this local, regional, international level with enormous uh, success for Verona herself that capitalized at this point also an enormous relevance in the, um, in the northeastern, especially Italian, scenario, right? And that came eventually to, uh, to be the, the most powerful uh, 
power in, in Veneto and at some point actually even the largest in Italy as we will see. Um, in, on this occasion you have sent Antony of Padua for example begging Anseline to release the San Bonifacios which was naturally exploited in a Guelph sense and considered that uh, at this time the propagandistic means were extremely advanced and sophisticated and refined. Just think about what was being uh, written and said uh, about Frederick II at this point. Right, this is the moment in which properly the hardcore ideological struggle between Guelphs and Ghibellines is defined, also uh, internationally. So there is really nothing strange about this all, especially the new historiography of the uh, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, uh, was extremely pervasive, especially in the cities, right? So um, these works were dramatically ideological because these men were, uh, were, as we have seen also in other videos, being able to describe even Mongol military um, culture and so on. So definitely intelligent individuals, but they were literally fabricating different versions of the story that were not real, just as the fact that, I don't know, Manfred had killed his father, Frederick II, or all these things that are, we know, historically, philologically, com completely invented. But at the time, they served a very specific purpose, and uh, the Ghibellines didn't have the same level of um, refinement in propaganda spread, but also its content was pretty pretty harsh in the same place. Essentially, they were saying that the Pope was the Antichrist, so the, basically the same thing. It was a dramatic homogeneity also in the uh, spaces we are, we are discussing. So it's normal that uh, a negative view of Edselin would, would emerge from a time that would see also fundamentally the, the failure of Frederick II's project in Italy and thus also one of his uh, greatest allies. Right, that Anselin uh, really was. In fact, um, at this point, uh, violence escalated also with other cities because the Paduans, um, among which many Veronese Guelphs had also taken refuge, began to carry out raids in the eastern district of Verona in a typical uh, communal warfare. Right, uh, these. Um, the Italian cities were pretty sizable because they were bulky, imposant infrastructures developed from the the bases of the, the Roman ones, further extended with multiple city rings exactly in these years. So besieging them was, uh, especially by a single city against another, practically impossible, right? So most of the effort um, was... Um, made in fact eroding the city's supplies making a scorched earth um, offensive strategy destroying the crops and so on also because they were pretty fertile uh, districts and at, at a very short um, distance from a city to another so they um, say could easily target say from Verona to Padua and vice versa because there are just some some tens of kilometers really and the degree of projection of medieval armies just 30 kilometers a day so uh, it, it's a deeply compressed reality where you can't be uh, safe at any moment so it, it it's even bitter as a struggle and considering the enormous wealth that it was at stake there is nothing really to be surprised of. and that's because of this that Edseline the third asks for help from the Emperor Frederick II, right? And this is the moment in which the Emperor properly provides Ezzelin with the title of Vicar in Italy. In other words, uh, the Imperial Vicariate simply meant that you were the, uh, the Emperor's representative, in this case in the, in the Italic Kingdom, which conferred an enormous power because the emperor was basically saying, look, the, the struggle now must be led by this lord from this city. And so all the Ghibellines would essentially flock this place or just would coordinate with, um, with, with, the, with the top that was embodied by Edselin, right, who uh, thus reinforced further his 
position and also the imperial one that as we've seen needed especially the Brenner pass open to bring troops from uh, Germany um, even though most of this struggle was carried out from from Sicily right and w also with forces actually belonging to in fact to the to the Italian Ghibellines rather than else um, I made a video about exactly this period in Frederick II's reign actually I think a couple one specifically and uh, different ones about uh, his reign in general so you know that the situation in Germany was rapidly deteriorating right Frederick had important um, power bases in in Swabia mostly um, and that's where most of the troops uh, would would come from right in in help um, of the Ghibelline cause but um, the, the 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 German monarchy as such was collapsing now the same Emperor was practically behaving like just another prince of the empire and trying to uh, consolidate as much as possible in terms of political territorial acquisitions even beyond what had been public governorship that uh, since Ottonian times with ups and downs had characterized uh, the, the German monarchy. Um, we will talk at, at some point about the wars of the Second Lombard League against Frederick II and so on more in detail, but that's the context. It, it, there were pretty bitter struggles in which the Imperial Army was time victorious but finally defeated properly on the field as it, it had already occurred uh, with Frederick's grandfather, Frederick I. Um, Ezzelin at this point was also Podesta of Verona and thus he had like full uh, full power right to to wage wars against the Guelph enemies right so imperial vicar Podesta of the city so he had the full control of the the army uh, um, campaign and de facto also the government of the city and there is uh, an incredible series of wars um, and battles, uh, s uh, looting of cities and towns, uh, the uh, seizure of Guelph castles, um, which uh, naturally engulfed the entire region. The pact between Ezzelin III, the Roman, and Frederick II was sanctioned by the marriage between the Baronese Podesta and Selvaggia, daughter of Frederick II, uh, a natural daughter, celebrated, interestingly enough, in the Basilica of St. Zeno with the presence of the Emperor and his famous minister, the notary Pierre de la Vigna, who um, stayed uh, in the Abbey itself at the time. As we've seen, the Basilica of St. Zeno had already been the um, the place of many I imperial uh, celebrations, burials. Verona had held the imperial uh, diet at times. So this imperial Ghibelline legacy was being reinforced further under the, the Roman regime. Violence flared in the mark to the point of exhaustion so that Friar John of Schio tried to pacify uh, the region thanks to his remarkable eloquence, but also essentially carrying out um, a greater political and even military project that had the support of uh, the papacy and thus was aimed at reducing uh, Ghibelline power in the same Verona. John started from Bologna and then moved to Padua, meaningfully enough, uh, so to important Guelph centers historically and numerous other cities, however, becoming famous as a, a man of God in, in a short time. The last destination of his journey was Verona. Uh, at the gates of which he appeared at the head of thousands of faithful and soldiers, right, you, uh, proposing what he called a, uh, quote, universal peace treaty. And at this point, given that the situation was pretty strained and that uh, also the imperial fortune was somehow 
wavering, Esselin stood aside, right? Because if he had at that point uh, tried to resist from the struggles that would have emerged, he may have been, um, you know, brought down. Um, and for this reason, uh, Friar John of Skia was soon granted unlimited powers both in Verona and in Vicenza, which is a, a smaller city in, in the east. Um, and it's it practically in between Verona and, and, and Padua, at least in the, in, the, in, in the north. And as a consequence, though, the, um, the wealth, de facto, started to arrest lots of people. Right, and this was part of the papal propaganda that stressed the fact that not just the Ghibellines were kind of just simple temporal political opponents. Of course not, right? Fighting against the papal cause, supporting an excommunicated emperor, they were also um, heretics per se, right? And this was actually a time of heresy in general. The mendicant orders had just been established to counter the spread of heterodoxy, especially within the, the richest cities in Europe that were the hotbed, let's say, in fact, of this greater, um, in fact, heretical movement, or also, in fact, uh, somehow an, an heterodox one that could at some point be co-opted even by the papacy in the form, in fact, of especially the Franciscans, to kind of gain support also from the other side. Um, and all these accusations were mixed with political ones, right? And so also, in fact, from the propaganda of the time that leaves in the literature and so on, we are portrayed with examples of famous Ghibelline leaders that were accused of heresy in the form of Epicureanism or other other uh, philosophies, ideas, etc. that were not really there, right? These were absolutely pious Christians that even if at some point had exploited certain currents to gain more power had never been heretical or pursued some kind of um, atheistic or anti-Catholic uh, ideas, right? As a matter of fact, we know that some of them were particularly pious, right? And um, let's say even in the case of unprejudiced minds like Frederick II, there is no proof or sense or meaning by the 13th century to speak of atheism or it, it, it's a complete... Um, invention that, by the way, not even for the propaganda of the time was actually meant in the way contemporary people have decided to make anybody that somehow opposed the church some sort of hero free thinking that, uh, first of all, has never existed historically anywhere, but that at the time especially was kind of uniformly a Catholic Christian. So um, the the heterodox, um, and speaking about the elites in particular, because if, if you like, first of all, like, we don't have any... You, do you know what would have happened if one of these leaders had actually been an heretic? It would have basically destroyed their entire political or social future. Most heresies were spreading among environments that were essentially trying to escape the established order, and these individuals, such powerful lords like Ethelin, were doing anything but the contrary, actually, to increase the grip uh, from that point of view. So these were, of course, political excuses, but also quite quite effective ones, right? Uh, there is an incredibly clever, smart, cold iron logic in what the, the papacy was doing, um, and that's what also the, the Ghibellines were, were paying off. Um, so much so that uh, after the burning of more than 60 men and women at the stake in a few days, uh, in as presumed erratics or erratics will sometimes do the world indeed it was Vicenza who rose up right uh, against um, John and who left with um, with an army from Verona to crush the the Byzantine rebels but was repulsed while in turn Verona having learned of the failure of John's expedition rebelled herself, forcing him to take refuge in Bologna, right? It was more safely Guelph, but importantly distant also from uh, from Verona. Um, 
it's at this point that Ethelin III returns to power in the city, and in 1239 bans the major exponents of the Veronese Guelph families. Mm-hmm. Even the Ghibellines, and in particular the Montecchi, were not happy uh, with the situation that had um, been produced, so that Ethelin reformed some laws. He enlarged the council uh, by creating the Council of, of the 500s, formed by the exponents of the arts and gave a council of 15 old people the keys to the city of Verona, which was a way to fundamentally reassure the Ghibellin establishment in this regard and kind of uh, co-opt and uh, it, uh, given him more rights within the Veronese government. In this state of affairs, the same Frederick II began to worry about Ezzelino's power. Right, so much so that he decided to hold, in 1245, an imperial diet in Verona herself. In this context, Ezzelin was repeatedly accused of heresy by the participating bishops. And at this point, even the Veronese began to notice the concerns that tormented the emperor. Uh, There were so many popular riots against Frederick that um, the emperor was forced to leave without even concluding the diet. This shows, well, all the struggles that were agitating in Verona at the time. Ezzelin was actually furious of this, because even though he was essentially defending his position in the empire, uh, and exactly for this, the fact that the Veronese would rebel to the imperial presence in a moment in which also things were actually not faring well for the Hohenstaufen as well, um, and thus was, you know, fundamentally harming the same imperial policy in the position of Verona, as we have seen between Italy and Germany in this kind of universal policy, and so increasing the prestige of the city, had numerous people arrested and tortured, meanwhile continuing military uh, actions right against the, uh, the surrounding neighbors. As a consequence, Pope Alexander IV launched a crusade against Ezzelin himself. When Ezzelino learned of the fact that Padua, that as we've seen was his hometown actually, had given herself spontaneously to the Papas in this context, so de facto institutionalizing her Guelphness, whereas up to that point there had been some kind of healthy uh, struggle between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines there too, he vented his anger on the Veronese people. And there was a massacre in the, in the same Verona, in fact, which began on June, t- June the 25th, 1256. Um, consider this point, uh, Frederick is dead, so the entire imperial system is um, not yet falling apart because there was still Manfred in Sicily um, and a strong uh, Ghibelline, autonomous Ghibelline presence in Italy, but everything was turning much more agitated than before. The repression went on for eight days straight, uh, allegedly without distinction of age, sex, and status. Some people were beheaded, others hanged, the most unfortunate burned or quartered. And interestingly enough, this massacre was carried out by the Paduan troops that had remained faithful to Ezzelin, right? So, um, as we've seen, yes, there was not uh, a, a radical difference between Veronese and Paduans as far as, you know, the, the language or whatever uh, cultural aspect was concerned, but the political allegiance, this is the point, right? These Paduan troops had been now expelled by Padua, as we've seen, um, had turned volley Guelph. These were the Ghibellines that had signed it with, with Esseline and had remained faithful to them. So they felt kind of, first of all, more dependent on him. They were outsiders. So in the city, they depended on the Lord. Um, and thus they would be the one who carried out the massacres against the Veronese that, of course, were 
in this case selected also on the base of some in fact opposition that had been carrying out against Adseline but were seen as foreigners as far as the municipal mentality of the Italian communes was concerned. So as you understand a pretty dramatic tormented moment that culminated as a sort of classical tragedy mixed with God's a judgment as it's beautifully from a literary point of view um, described by the history of Albertino Musato much later but that in fact was immortalized in a perhaps too much uh, idealized fashion. Um, on September the 29th 1259 it's Adzelin during one of his military expedition was defeated in a battle on the Adda River in Lombardy. He was captured and died shortly after. Um, as far as it seems like it would be normal, he was uh, wounded uh, in a foot and the uh, the wound infected, he died of septicemia because he was apparently carried uh, just to prison and still he, he refused to, to even take off uh, the armor for a long time so he decided to die apparently as he felt that his power, um, especially after that, military defeat was crumbling politically. Um, and this is the end of the tyrant of the almost monster Anselin that, however, was for that matter a you know, perfect politician and uh, military leader of, of those times, right? Pursuing very shrewdly his goals uh, with all the means available and quite quite capably as we've seen and against gigantic forces again even managing to marry uh, the emperor's daughter and uh, embodying the, again the, the sense of the imperial being an imperial bakery in the in the Veronese mark historically was of the meaning that we have portrayed in fact much of the Adzelin's legacy would be collected by the de la Scala as we will see now uh, in fact, upon Ezzelin's death, Verona was the only city under his dominion. Um, he had lost uh, all the others, right? Not that the, uh, say, the Veronese had ever kind of colonialistically occupied another city. This didn't happen historically. It was, as we were saying before, just saying, okay, you can be Ezzelin Podesta of, I don't know, of Parma or of this other, I don't know city for a while and then coordinating the forces there in this incredibly complicated picture that today I'm not even addressing telling the truth because it would make the video much longer than it already is um, so Verona from again a communal perspective remained uh, her own in a way um, and managed to resist the Guelph onslaught as well the Ghibelline establishment maintained control of the city. Right? In fact, the Podesta of Verona, as early as 1258, was the Ghibelline Mastino I della Scala. Now, I explained this in the previous video about Verona, that the Scaliger dynasty used these names, literally referring to the warhound, to the um, dog heads, the Chinochefali of Paul the Dick and essentially the Ulfednars, right? Uh, that were a this kind of, if not totemic, but properly, they, they owned the symbolism of the bear wolf. The entire Baronese and Venetian area uh, still bears today the toponym of Khans and Khanlis names uh, related to the idea of the dog, the wolf, that. Um, in the feudal symbolism had transmuted in the just like it was before in the Germanic Comitatus but also in Rome just I mean think about the the wolf uh, and Mars and so on the um, in fact the symbol of the of the initiated youth in the in the military brotherhoods of the, of the Comitatus right and so this um, warlords that the, the emperor still embodied in a way as the supreme authority um, and matching thus the Ghibelline loyalty to the emperor right so the Scaligers having the blood this thing it, it's interesting because the Scaligers weren't even of uh, of noble 
origin were great uh, families still in, like the Esther, like others that we've seen that were true ancient feudal nobility as far as we can reconstruct um, the the de la scala had emerged if i'm not wrong like uh, textile fabric merchants right very rich very powerful um and we have found them pretty early right since the 12th century being there so they had already quite importance were an old important prestigious family and they are the ones that would bring verona to the greatest power as we will see now literally um, by the the early 14th century the de la scala had the second largest military in europe after the kingdom of france mm -hmm. and naturally we're talking about multiple cities brought under the de la scala seniors so and not verona alone right a consistent part as we will see now of northeastern also part of central italy uh, but still meaningful enough because they were controlled by um, the same Veronese lordship and um, despite uh, the and, and by the way regarding to the the La Scala just for some heraldic kind of symbolism and so on the Scala in Italian is ladder right any figures as you have already seen here in the pictures they upload in this white ladder on a red background and this was a long bird symbol because basically the, the legion sent that Albuin, king of the Longbirds, had been buried under a staircase uh, in the Veronese palace, and that uh, and there were in fact um, in fact legions associated to the idea again a bit like with Barbarossa would form later that these old this, this heroes of the Germanic epos would um, would rise again right with their uh, magic sword and that all those who uh, wanted to to be as powerful as them would have, have to wield their own power, their own arms. Um, and so when you realize also the, the Scaligers uh, used common names like Albuin uh, itself and so on, you realize that this deeply ingrained kind of Longberg Ghibelline um, hardcore identity was... Uh, quite appropriate to the imperial vicars of Italy and consider again that there would be uh, other other imperial vicars for example the the, the Milanese that uh, at some point would become Ghibelline themselves even though they had had it during the times of the Lombard League in fact the struggle against the Emperor but the the La Scala also because of the Veronese position again on the Adige Valle and so on were somehow always more important for German. It also mattered in, again, in the imperial dynasty. They had a, a quite important connection and coordination with southeastern Germany, as we will see. So uh, the uh, the German emperors, especially during the princely phase of uh, the country's history after the interregnum, I made a video about that, would always kind of try to, to make of northeastern Italy, as we were saying before, a sort of German land on, on its own, not culturally, but still as a part of this broader polity that had always still considered Lombardy and or uh, certain frontier areas as part, like uh, you, can, you can interpret the Veronese as such, as part of a direct, um, or at least a you know, consistently close German rule, per se. Um, and the De La Scala embodied deeply this... Um, um, the symbolism even though they were also quite uh, aware of their own power and autonomy and jealous of such so it was always a matter of, of compromise and negotiation but the Ghibelline fate was was always there um, and despite of the continuous wars that would engulf Italy in which Manfred was trying to affirm again a Ghibelline hegemony on the peninsula and Charles of Anjou would come to to defeat him and then there would be Conradin's passage we'll see it now um, and even though Italy was pacified still the the existing Ghibelline regimes had a very tough time so Verona was definitely under pressure this was a happy period for the letters Verona was a great cultural center in Italy the Provencal Trobadour uh, exiled from France following the Papal Crusade against the Albigensian 
found a safe haven in the city, and that's part of the reason why also uh, there were some uh, suspicion about uh, the heterodoxy of some Veronese in that regard. Uh, but there was also an important influence from Bavaria uh, with the culture of the Minnesenka, so this um, a German troubadour, if we can say, that spread. And so also in a quite unique combination in Verona that becoming an ever more seigneurial center looked ever more like the seat of a court, right, that embraced also that more kind of seigneurial, feudal, chivalric lifestyle and policy, considered that uh, the, the La Scala would make a precocious use of foreign mercenaries. Um, the Ghibelline uh, seigneuries provided themselves earlier than others, especially with the Germans sent, or at least um, say remain in, in Italy on the base of some sort of kind of this international allegiance to the empire at the service of the Ghibelline lords such as in Pisa and Milan in Verona um, and thus there was really but there, there weren't the only the only nationality right foreign one um, and more of that later but it, it's important to stress as a connection again between the, the La Scala and their feudal duties if you want um, in Verona as we've seen, the Ghibelline faction had by now gained the upper hand as an institutional orientation of the commune. And under Mastino the I, the La Scala, the city also transitioned um, in practice with all the graduality, of course, of the process. F and in a non-traumatic form, from the communal to the seigneurial government. In 1262, Mastino was in fact appointed as, uh, quote, perpetual general captain of the people, which was one of those titles that de facto equated to a sort of, um, not a monarchy, but, you know, the fact that at least this was a lifetime title, as you understand. And so uh, summing up some mm, normal offices, such as, for example, the captain of the people that, makes of Verona as well a um, popolo signory that is technically that the people here we skipped the, the thing but it's important as well had uh, was not li literally just the commoners right sometimes were very powerful uh, noblemen themselves um, but mostly the, the merchant oligarchy in part the same de la Scala were as we've seen coming from that uh, humans we can we can't say and the general captain of the people had somehow countered even the or at least cited the, the Podesta's power, um, the people here had been prevailing in at least within the city o over the the older traditional military nobility. Um, and thus, um, uh, owning power, they were, again, all very powerful families on the road. They entrusted this perpetual general Capitanate to, uh, in this case, one of the, the, the La Scala members that had uh, remained as the most powerful uh, house in in Verona, at least capable of maintaining control. The same. Um, this started, in fact, the seigniory, because the La Scala would remain fundamentally till the end of the Veronese independence. Uh, Mastino immediately tried to mitigate the civil conflicts uh, in, in, the, in the city, first of all, eventually passing to pacify the city district, which practically meant devastating the villages uh, of those who had followed uh, the, the Guelphs uh, in the previous years and that were still kind of nesting in, in, the, in the countryside as harbingers of, of revolt that were naturally fueled by foreign uh, cities. Um, and this process actually was beneficial because, as we've seen, a great part of the city's success politically and militarily passed through the resources that it could draw from, from, the, from the district. So without that, you couldn't quite even stabilize power internally because it doesn't matter how many people you exiled, still there were political connections, and even if you you know, stretch too much this, this um, 
this kind of harshness uh, on on people that had something to lose even by the exile of uh, some competitors rather than actual enemies you would endanger your own position so much um, in fact already in 1263 the Guelphs made an attempt on Mastino's life but the plot was discovered even before it could be carried out so uh, the Lord captured the conspirators sentenced them to death while those who managed to escape were helped by the San Bonifacios that were still uh, looming around. In 1265, also Trento um, rebelled. At this point, Verona had de facto maintain a control on the, on the city, and um, it, th th which was quickly reoccupied, right? And the same fate suffered the castles of Lonigo. Montecchio Maggiore and Montebello. This policy of territorial recompaction was particularly meaningful for a district like the one of Verona that is fundamentally well identified by the, the Adige Valley uh, on, uh, in the west, uh, on the, the border with, with the Garda Lake. You have essentially the Alps in the north and this more open eastern um, countryside. Uh, from which most of the threats really come from. There is an important Veronese projection towards the central Po Valley that was an area that, especially with the expansion of Milan, was was losing kind of uh, indiv uh, autonomy. Yeah, right? It was somehow fragmented in multiple communes of this were kind of uh, on the long way, telling the truth, of the sunset. So. Uh, there was possibility uh, from the side of the scavengers to interfere directly in these areas and coming to, to harass even Bologna and uh, uh, the Ferrara as well, given that that was also the era of the, the latter, I mean, of the Paul mouth. And so many, and also the Adige one, so many, uh, many strongholds on the, on the rivers were particularly strategic, uh, even though the area was somehow less populated and more full of swamps and kind of like that. So, uh, in a way, th there is... Um, Verona will be choked in the end, right? Most of the most profitable expansionism would take place towards the northeast, the subalpine area, because Verona suffered a bit of this, that compared to cities like, um, say, Bologna, or especially Milan, right, and um, later on, Verona will not be necessarily even the, str the strongest as the largest, right? Even Pado will pose some military threats that the Veronese could hardly counter if it hadn't been for great commanders like Cangrande. So the situation sh would require a bit more of general context, because uh, if you look at the map, you, if you without background, you you will really not understand whichever logic was there aside from you know which city bordered the other right but i can assure you it's radically complicated and deserves some perhaps in-depth video that i will make um on especially the first half of the 14th century in any case the international orientation of verona was pretty clear uh, in um, 1267, the Emperor Conradin of Swabia descended in Italy, at least he would manage to be crowned Emperor um, as the Pope fled Rome along the way, but you know he was embodying there, as you know, the, the legacy of the Hohenstaufen, so he, he had the Imperium from inside, at least until he was defeated at Tagliacozzo. Um, Conradin descended in Italy and uh, Mastino della Scala, faithful to the Swabian dynasty, supported him militarily, right? Even against the same Ghibellines of his rival Manfred of Swabia. This is important because, as you know, Manfred had. I made a video about him specifically. You find everything either in the Hohenstaufen and or Medieval Sicily playlist. Um, had usurped the Sicilian crown that technically belonged to Conrad, and in spreading fake news of his death in Germany. Um, and um, just to seize the, the throne uh, immediately. And so Manfred was defeated and killed by Charles of Anjou, so that settled the matter. 
um, at least as far as that side was concerned, but Conradin came there to claim the, the full legacy, right? So before that, uh, the, the La Scala had somehow realized that it was better to support uh, a German ruler than a Sicilian one in that specific context. Um, even though probably at some point they freaked out, especially after Benevent, when Charles of Manjou seized the entire Sicilian kingdom, spreading the, the Guelph of Germany, as, in fact, oh, as far as the, uh, the Veronese. Um, um, and on the occasion of Conradin's expedition, the entire city of Verona was excommunicated by the Pope, consequentially. The Guelphs took thus adva advantage once again to rise up in Mantua, that was somehow, a, if not a Berenice proxy um, regime, but still siding with Ghibelline Verona. However, the city was taken over by the Bonacolsi family that was allied with the De La Scala, and so the thing didn't really change, and they would remain fundamentally um, friends till the end. It was caused by the same De La Scala, by the way but in a completely different situation at that point. Um, the same year the excommunications were lifted, but at a very high price. In fact, Massino had to capture approximately 170 Cathar bishops and priests in Sirmione, um, and he should have also burned them at the stake, which he wouldn't do, actually, because he didn't feel like it. The thing would be however, still carried out um, in the arena of, of Verona after his death, right? So that's um, also, what do you think about the lovely scenario? Just know that, you know, that was the space where also um, these heretics were were burned alive. Um, but again, it, it had at least a, a function because um, the age of heresies was coming to an end this was transforming to something that um, really didn't have a future in the way that the, the Christendom and the Catholicism and the papacy had structured at that point um, the mendicant orders were also hegemonic they had won the battle against heresies they just were so these were pockets were fundamentally mopped up and even though there were some movements always remaining, and especially in this kind of subalpine reality, there were, for the same reason, some sort of fringe uh, that uh, didn't even have necessarily, as we were saying before, any kind of theological point. They right? were very often just anti-establishment and not much more. Under Massino de la Scala, Verona reached a remarkable state of well-being. Yet, the Guelphs still attempted a conspiracy in 1277. This time they succeeded, as Massino was killed together with the Nogarola, who was um, a family friend. The culprits who managed to escape were forbidden to return to Verona, while their homes were constitutionally razed to the ground, as we've seen. Uh, Massino was succeeded by his brother, Albert, the La Scala would boom the definitive transition from the commune to the seigneurial uh, regime took place, right, thanks to the great favor that uh, the, the La Scala obtained from the people, right, um, this this didn't happen anywhere in the, in the same way, there were just a few um, Italian city-states that at this, uh, say, this early on kind of accepted uh, the de facto establishment of a of a lordship, just Ferrara, a few others really, and mostly in this kind of relatively more peripheral centers compared to Lombardy in, in this case. Um, in fact, as soon as Albert came to power, he was entrusted with extensive um, uh, prerogatives within just. 10 days. So everything was uh, planned and carried out successfully. Albert was elected Podesta and had what was then called um, the Albertine Statute drafted. This was essentially a, um, 
a revision of the commune uh, juridical system, right? There was a, a major council made up of 500 citizens chosen by the Podesta each year. While at the heads of the guilds, there was the council of the Gastelds and the Crafts. So, as we've seen, the first council already existed, where was more political. This other one was somehow more practical. It was for administration, for for the for the crafts. The Gastels were in the tradition of the Longobard kingdom, the, um, the 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 king's official, right? And there was some sort of public vest still boasted as a legitimate form. Of, of government, it just had uh, remained in the in the administrative prior, prior institutional practice, right? Um, then there were some lesser councils because it was all in kind of guild fashion, as you understand. All medieval governments work with a multitude of different organisms, such as the Council of the Elders. Uh, and that of the 80s that, that were, were important in this regard don't, don't get me wrong but they had some more kind of um, officializing formalizing legitimizing and symbolic uh, functions than else uh, albert was also very uh, successful in settling advantageous pieces with brescia mantua and padua so the main uh, neighbors of Verona uh, and also Guelph cities that thus had been in contrast with this Scaliger Ghibellinism. And at different times, Verona will manage to rule over each of, of these cities, as a matter of fact. Among other things, it was precisely in these years that the Bishop of Verona allowed the German people of the Cimbrians, so-called, like uh, to, to settle in the semi-desert uh, territories of Lucenia, right, in, in the Alps. The, the Cimbrians were, essentially, they bore the same name of the older uh, people, right, of the first century, for, uh, BC, first millennium, first couple of centuries BC, that... Um, uh, had uh, migrated in Italy at the time, but here we're talking mostly about southern German people that were um, allowed to settle in the Alpine valleys controlled by Verona and maintaining, I think now that th they have almost disappeared, sadly enough, from a linguistic point of view, but some of the most, in fact, archaic and interesting um, Germanic languages documented because they had fundamentally just preserved themselves in the Alps, naturally with an important degree of, um, let's say, of shift from the original language, but still bearing um, quite interesting sostrata. Um, and thus, you see how the, the La Scala scenery extended uh, an important and secured an important territorial domination. Um, in strategically relevant uh, sectors, considered that, I don't know, even the Garda Lake was full of resources, the Adige Valley itself provided with many, and uh, there were opportunities for mostly in the eastern frontier, but also in the control of more alpine and subalpine territory that would shelter Verona from, and kind of increase even the, the international prestige, given again the role that those lands had for the imperial universal policy. At this point, um, we're still talking about not the interregnum because the Habsburgs are already in power, but um, still the lack of a Romfart in uh, to to you know by the side of, of the German monarchs. Um, at the beginning of the nineties, the the La Scala managed to extend their political control over. Um, important centers such as Este, Parma, and Reggio. This was done by um, essentially supporting militarily the, the local communes, um, receiving some 
fact, uh, prerogatives mostly, again, some offices, titles that could make Verona cash, some money in exchange for this military protection. So infiltrating in areas as Parma that are also beginning to be the sphere of other, of other powers, Milan, for example, that uh, is increasingly becoming the, the center of Lombardy, so gradually abs absorbing the, the surrounding cities, and thus entering in contrast as totally the, the, the larger cent and first center they would meet um, with Verona, right? So much so that even if, as we were saying before, Milan will become Ghibelline um, uh, in for good, still the two imperial vicaries will have a lot of attrition with each other and finally Verona it was the smaller system lost uh, the struggle even having uh, a Milanese lordship um, and this is the moment of the crisis of of the communes right that's the reason why such um, cities would temporarily give themselves spontaneously to Verona at some point, or better, the, the La Scala lordship. The conquests continued in 1299, when with his sons Alboin and Cangrande, Albert also took possession of Feltre, Cividale and Belluno, and these were instead in the east. As far as the core of the patriarchate of Aquileia, by the way, and this shows, um, given that Again, these were less urbanized areas compared to the Po Valley, so they were uh, easier to penetrate somehow, because at least Verona was um, a pretty sizable center, uh, the communal forces of which could, could extend control and still somehow feudalize areas like the Northeast. So the, the capacity of political penetration and projection toward that area are remarkable, but at the same time they somehow show that Verona was avoiding, or probably not having the resources to enter like fully in the game of, say, the central Po Valley with important urbanization, lots of cities, and especially contending power to Milan. It was also quite watchful about what the Veronese were, were doing from their side. Um, Albert I died in 1301, leaving three children and his wife, Verde, that is green, of, of Salizzole, who died in 1306. Uh, the eldest son was Bartolomeo, the second Alboin, and the third, um, technically Can Francis, uh, Dog Francis, that's literally the name, known as Can Grande, which means great dog. And again, the as we've seen, there is Mastino, Hound, Can, which is dog um, in Venetian. Um, so, the um, the symbology of of the of the loyal imperial vassal uh, somehow wolf, beast wolf military brotherhood that you can admire also in the crests of these great lords um, in the sculpture arcs that are their mausoleums uh, in in Verona and that in fact depict this. Um, uh, winged uh, dog heads, right, symbolizing the imperial power, the winged glory, but on this dog that again in the feudal hierarchy was still rising from the ranks, right, to achieve greater power. And, and th this um, the symbolism is, is extraordinary if, if you really think about that. Also because this man, as we will see, were among some, some of the greatest uh, warriors of their time, especially Khan Grande, by far, like he was not uh, he was among the greatest uh, commanders in Italy in his time, but more properly, differently, even from people who worked for him, as we will see. Um, at least never had the chance of fighting um, like a 30,000 versus 30,000 man battle, and probably would have been amazed by his capabilities there. Because there, there is no major pitch battle b between um, Verona, especially Padua, and her enemies, because of the surroundings, how we have described them. But he literally spent his life on horseback, and um, he got wounded lots of times, um, and he uh, just 
he carried out some feats, like even charging like with, with six men against four under things of this kind, but even more, multiple times and winning in the process. That is by f makes Cangrande by far the greatest warrior known in in Italy at the time. And in fact, his tomb has been opened, and he's of a pretty large man, a huge jaw, and this kind of it makes you understand the harsh, brutal kind of hardcore. Um, and vicious war likeness of these individuals, also as far as the physical sustainability was concerned. Um, but he was also a great man of letters, right? He welcomed Dante, he was fond of uh, music, of, of, of literature, and so on. So he patronized the arts. So, uh, actually, a, a very, uh, very fascinating character. It was, however, the eldest son, Bartolomeo, that came into power after. Albert's death, um, and um, he um, managed to take possession of Riva and Arco in the Trentino area, Riva, the Guard Lake, uh, so securing also an opening on the on the lake that would send, from the other side of which there is Lombardy, properly met, so also from a Milanese perspective is kind of um, warring, and you know, through the Veronese, also the Venetians later on, as we will see, will take the same direction. So it was actually dangerous in some way. There is still Bergamo in between Brescia and Milan, but Brescia is just next to the Garda Lake, and the Veronese would seize control of her as well. Um, Bartholomew died, however, on March the 7th, 1304, childless. Thus, he left place to his brother Alboin. It was second. Alboin wanted, however, his younger brother Cangrande to power together with him. Um, and that's how he, they actually won the Brescian shore of the Lake Garda through amphibious operations and won also some battles against Este, Brescia, and Parma again. So confirming the capacity of the Veronese to push also west. Right towards the central Po Valley and um, showing definitely their ambitions. Now, the most important event, turning point in the, the La Scala Signory, is the Italian expedition of Henry VII of Luxembourg. Uh, I made a video about, uh, I think, him and Ludwig IV, uh, that is also important for the Veronese. And I also made a video on the foreign expeditions in uh, intervention in Italy in the 14th century. Um, so there is a bit of Henry the Seventh there, and uh, his expedition is dramatically overlooked for many reasons because people just quote Dante that somehow said, "Oh my God, this guy had to do so much, but he wouldn't accomplish anything." Well, because he died, right? And he actually accomplished a lot. That he is compacting um, the Po Valley that after the uh, conquest of Sicily by Charles of Anjou had been largely under wealth hegemony to the Ghibelline cause, right? This is also the, the way in which the Visconti, for example, uh, not much rose to power, came back to Milan after the exile of the Guelph de la Torre that were supported by the Angevins and were appointed imperial vicars. Um, the expedition was important from a military point of view. Um, uh, Henry wa was uh, from Luxembourg, so he actually uh, entered Italy from the Susa Valley in the west, and he was a, essentially a French speaker rather than, than a German one. Um, so Verona was not the first, uh, the first place where also later properly German emperors would descend from again um, in the Po Valley. Um, so first he occupied Milan, overthrowing the De La Torre and re-establishing the Visconti in the process. Then he entered uh, Verona though, and Vicenza, that was given to Verona, interestingly enough. This aspect triggered the uh, 20 years of war that Cangrande fought at that point against Padua. Uh, up to that point, the three cities were separated, but Verona simply uh, occupied Vicenza and at that point began to make war against Padua, vice versa. Padua was actually better 
output, militarily speaking, it was more powerful, it had larger armies, um, but very often were not so orderly like or warlike or at least led by such uh, a great military mind like Cangrande, so that they failed in uh, defeating Verona that at some point could lose, could be occupied. The same Vicenza was threatened multiple times and saved by Cangrande miraculously at the last moment. But the most important thing is definitely the reconfirmation of imperial victory to um, to both Alboin, that was, as we've seen, the elder brother, and Cangrande. Alboin, however, soon died, uh, and Cangrande was thus the sole ruler and imperial vicar of Verona. And telling the truth, the emperors had a preference towards the Veronese, because uh, the Visconti in Milan were already very powerful on their own, so they were, of course, uh, at that point siding with the emperor, also because now, literally, they had to fight their way through the Po Valley to, to curb definitely wealth power on the wake of this enormous army that um, Henry had come with, uh, but that would be increasingly filled with, with Italians, because normally there, there were Burgundians, French, Germans, right? So some, especially the Germans remained in Italy at the service of the Ghibelline lords at that point. Um, if you watch that video made on medieval Pisa, especially the, the second branch, like this one from 1200 to 1500, you, you'll see there what uh, Uguccione della Fagiola that we will meet now also in Verona with Cangrande did as after he was as a, a exiled from Pisa, but scoring the greatest military success of, of the time. Uh, in the largest battle in Europe of the time that nobody cares about because the uh, um, Oxford Encyclopedia of Medieval Warfare doesn't even list it, which is an embarrassment to the dignity of mankind, given that you know this should be a, you know th this should be the highest scientific standards. You don't even know that that battle was fought. It is literally the largest, and actually one of by far the most important, especially as far as the task and balance was concerned. But not only. In any case with the German mercenaries. But that Cangrande also began to uh, foster, in a way, um, in Verona. Uh, there were also some Catalans and French that had uh, served Padua, that defected to, to Verona, interestingly enough. So those were actually the very first, in a way. And there were also some Burgundians, properly from Henry VII's army. This is not particularly important, just, uh, say, it shows how the, the La Scala began also as imperial vicars to act ever more lordly and saying we are the actual protectors, say, of the Germans in Italy. Right? And this is literally what they became because lots of German mercenaries also came, started to come there and to be hired by the, the, these powers. And when Ludwig of Bavaria entered Italy with, say, 400 knights, the, the, the Italian Ghibellines told him, look, we have thousands ourselves, so there is no need for you even to bring more. So that tells you that the scale of power that these signories had reached, compared even to the same German monarchy that at that point was basically fractured in a sort of just at best regional um, private base, right? Just like the same lordships. Um, and uh, the the descent in Italy of Henry VII triggered 20 years of continuous war. Great part of the l Italian lordships were actually molded in this period because the system was also exhausted at, in the mid of the 14th century. The, the crack in the great medieval civilization happened, so all the system contracted on a seigneurial base. And the Della Scala were in part the ones that kind of rode the wave the boldest in Italy at the point, but also suffered of, of the fact that Verona was not, say, so big as Milan, it was already much more statile in, in, in outlook and could also absorb in a much more orderly way the various Lombard uh, cities already, which Verona couldn't, right? This is the great difference, really. Um, but uh, this, in fact, doesn't make um, the, the La Scala accomplishments less uh, remarkable, because actually at some point they came to threaten the same Milan given their power. Cangrande uh, it w is, is the, the prototype, not just, of, again, the, the restle restless knight, uh, successful commanders, but also an, an enlightened and respected gentleman, 
great, a great lord uh, to whom uh, Dante uh, dedicated the entire paradise, um, uh, prophesizing uh, actually the the rise of the della Scala to the essentially rulers of Italy at the time after the death of Henry the Seventh, um, and this not just because Dante was, uh, as you know, in exile in in Verona after having in fact been expelled by Florence uh, because of the Black Wealth and and Pope Boniface uh, the Eighth. Um, at this point. Uh, in order to counter this major Ghibelline onslaught in the Pope Valley, Padua made a league with the San Bonifacio, Treviso, that is an, another commune in uh, just in the northeast of uh, of Padua, and Aquileia, whose patriarchate, as we've seen, was penetrated by the De La Scala politically and, and militarily, so uh, this was not a, such an impressive host as it sounds, because again, the San Bonifacio was just exiles, Treviso was, was less powerful than these communes and actually would be absorbed by the same the La Scala. Aquileia was also kind of uh, d mostly dwelling on her own, not with, you know, with, as we've seen in the video about Friuli, with greater problems of internal cohesion than, you know, con concerns of expansionism for that matter. But Padua was actually very powerful, right? And they, the Paduans could field alone uh, armies of even tens of thousands of men against which they marched against the, the La Scala, but at some point failing, you know, just out of sh sheer logistical issues at some point. There were so many episodes that are told by the aforementioned Albertino Musat about these wars that are very interesting. At some point we could even make a video about them. Um, in any case, it's a constant struggle. Yes, th there were some mm, truces rather than peace treaties, such as the one of 1314. After which, for example, the, the same following year, Padua invaded Vicenza, and that's the episode in which Gangrande literally ran to the city because there was nobody to defend it and he didn't have an army while the Paduans had an enormous array um, and he managed just to repel them uh, wait th this was in 1317 this was a first one in which he already managed to repel them just by if I'm not wrong at that point kind of ambushing them within still the city also letting them in and then um, taking them down but the the scale of desperation was was enormous, right? The the the, the episode of thirteen seventeen is worth mention because it tells you all the scale of Cangrande's bravery and value as a commander. He entered Vicenza again while the Paduans were getting in, right, crossing the walls and redeploying inside, and that's where he under he, even though the Paduans were something like I don't know in the tens of thousands, he had just a handful of knights. He um, coordinated uh, an attack with Oguccione della Fagiola, the um, Pisan exile. Actually, he was a million, but uh, he had become a, a lord of Pisa and had scored that magnificent victory over Philip of Taranto, the you know the nephew of, of Robert of Anjou. That uh, you know was again the greatest Ghibelline victory and almost threatened the, the Florence herself. Um, but then Uguccione had tried to make, uh, to, to impose his rule with his German mercenaries from Henry VII's expedition in the peasant government that said nuts, also because the war was starting to cost too much, and so he was expelled. He went to Cangrande, and he uh, basically attacked the Paduans from a, a suburb, attacking from the flank. It was even countered by Paduan um, infantry unit, uh, but um, the, um, the, the 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 cavalry managed to break through, and Cangrande literally, first of all, crushed the the Paduans that had entered the city. Then he opened the gates and he launched himself like a few tens of knights against mass o masses of Paduan pikemen, crossbowmen, pavismen, and knights, too, 
and he first routed hundreds of them and then the others realized that what was going on and they started surrounding him but Ogutuna came in time and they managed to make a massacre of the Padawans. It was a clamorous victory but just think of what it means having that scale of power and realizing that if you don't risk your life su in a suicide fashion you, you don't even have a chance to to maintain it so he actually won through these struggles but there are many other examples he was wounded many times he stormed castles um, with his Germans uh, literally assaulting the, the, the battlements himself he was shot at a leg by a crossbow bolt together with his nephew while trying to negotiate the surrender of Padwan stronghold um, he was uh, at the gates of Padua that he managed to threaten and eventually to to even control uh, by by enemy German mercenaries um, and some of his German mercenaries took him back another time he was about to be killed by some angry peasants that surrounded him and he managed to escape um, luckily just because of a fast horse um, but he was a master organizer and strategist he had great um, explorers um, he carried out impressive military engineering feats he built an enormous castle with like three um, fences out of nothing on on the um, on the all, the all these river crossroads in from the side of Padua that could literally take away the water from the city from right with incredible even hydraulic engineering um, Kangran is one of the greatest figures uh, of in the European Middle Ages, but a very few people kind of even know him. And it's kind of weird, because at least everybody knows him, maybe if you have heard Dante, but when you actually study what he he did on the field, you, you, you are mind blown. And these are very well documented rallies. We often don't have even this info for for some of the greatest, even kings of the time, and things like that. So it's quite interesting to analyze oh. um, so there are many instances for example in that victory in 1315 14 he captured uh, one of the Dakarara that were some of the most powerful families in, in Padua and the interesting thing about this is that like in other instances as Musato tells us because he was literally captured while he was a commander himself as a citizen in the Paduan army by the by the the Scaligers, because he, I think it was in the same episode of, of Vicenza when Cangrande counterattacked and and Musato threw himself <laughs> on, from from the city walls in, into the moat and he broke his arm and then all the captured Padwans were treated very courtly uh, by by Cangrande who wanted to who was searching for sympathies in Padua to have you know maybe the gates of the city open and some political support against uh, the war against him um, and so all these shrewd interesting stories and so everybody was impressed with him because again he was one of these great lords of the north right of of Lombardy broadly meant that uh, struck the the medieval senses of um, you know of pride of of glory of of beauty telling the truth this this people were uh, interesting we, we know even their appearances like Cangrande was blonde blue-eyed uh, like Castruccio for example um, and interestingly enough he died in, in 1329 together with some of the other greatest commanders of the time such as Castruccio of Lucca uh, Shara Colonna of Rome these were some of the greatest commanders of the time as well you know this night magnificent magnificent knightly fashion that mostly um, Typical of that 13, four, early 14th century rather than the condottieri age of later times, which is um, removed, I think, also from the popular imagery, because it's it's an area that has not been clearly conceptualized, like in popular culture and historical knowledge. But I think if you are um, interested in medieval history, you, you must really know. Um, in fact, uh, the aforementioned Carrara was treated as a guest until the peace of 1315 for the same reasons. He wanted, Cangrande wanted to show the, the power and the, the magnificence of Verona and the magnanimity, right, to, to buy something from the Carrara. 
In all this, during this big wars that were engulfing the entire peninsula, telling you the truth, um, in 1318 in Sanchino, Cangrande was even appointed general captain of the Ghibelline League, which is something that the Visconti didn't like so much. Apparently, uh, at the peak of his power, Cangrande had a sort of highway built to reach Milan from the east, and even claiming some sort of, like, I'm the greater lord of some, some, uh, over Milan in some way. And, and th there was, um, of course, that was an exaggeration, but there are deep rivalries between the Visconti that were also perhaps a less close-knit client because they often also killed each other and so on, but, but also because they, they control a much wider amount of power in cities and so on. But the rivalry there was bitter. Also because Cangrande was quite young. He came to power, consider when he was 17, he died when he was 38. But he accomplished these military feats that even older commanders had difficulty to, to, to prove, right? You can argue that the De La Scala um, pow peak of power was just embodied by Cangrande. If, if he hadn't been the leader, Verona would have been defeated. We would talk of some sort of Padman scenery extending greater power or some sort of stuff like that. Um, in 1325 Cangrande was struck by a serious illness and the rumor spread that he was dead and as a consequence Frederick de la Scala, that was the Count of Valpolicella, had himself elected prince but upon Cangrande's recovery he, um, he was banished uh, together with his family as well as the other ones that uh, participated to the conspiracy, including De Montecchi that always appear, you know, if anything we remember De Montecchi chiefly because of Shakespeare, right? But uh, they were, as we have seen also in the previous video, one of the most powerful clans in, in Verona. In 1328, um, a papal legate called a crusade against the Saint Cangrande. Again, there were accusations of heresy, that were completely normal for the time. Everybody was accused of that. Also, the Lord of, of Milan, also the Emperor, wh whoever was against the Emperor was a, was heretical, immediately as excommunicated. And the reason of this crusade was that objectively, Cangrand, as we will see now, had created an enormous dominion, um, built um, as in fact a collection of signories over several cities, as a matter of fact. And, and at this point, the, the, all the Guelph neighbors were being battered and um, uh, defeated uh, by Cangrande. So that this massive northeastern Italian uh, ghibelline blob was taking place and kind of even entering Tuscany, passing from the Apennine or uh, from the Guri. It was uh, an enormous thing. Consider that Cangrande, first of all, managed to defeat the same Padua and essentially assuming the dominion of the same city because Padua was literally exhausted. Padua was much more, uh, had a popular government um, as Guelph was also kind of anti-lordly, uh, anti-lordship in a sense, more kind of the Republican people of some, uh, of some sort. And for this reason, it, it lacked unity, it was somehow permeable. They called also foreign uh, sceneries, such as the ones of even the Habsburgs at some point that used as vicars the Counts of, of Gorizia. Um, but at the end of the day, Padua was basically brought under Verona, and this conferred, given that Padua was very rich, by the way, and controlled a very important area, essentially, in the east you have Venice, the lagoon, in, in the south you have properly the, the Adige, uh, the lower Adige uh, riverway, so it was an enormous success and this opened Verona, the, uh, the, 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 the control of many other territories. In fact, Cangrande became Lord of so Verona. Vicenza that had remained in power, Padua that we have just seen, Treviso that he had laid siege to and finally conquered after ferocious storming. Um, Liberalis of Levada describes beautifully the, the um, Scaliger assaults um, in that context. 
Belluno in the northeast, Monselice, Bassano, as well as um, the imperial vicariate of Mantua, right, and properly the command of the Italian Ghibellines conferred by the Holy Roman Emperor. This was a huge power, and it wasn't ending here, right, because as we will see after Cangranda's death, that occurred only at the age of 38, um, the story says, um, struck by an illness taken while drinking from a cold source, but some say actually poisoned, also because this was seemingly ascertained by the the autopsy on 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 the on the body in contemporary times recently. Um, so this tells you what kind of forces were agitating still within behind the the scenes, right? So being a, a, a member of the Scaliger dynasty wasn't easy at all because also they had their own feuds and so on. But this was definitely a premature and unexpected death uh, for the, the whole seniory. Uh, also because Cangranda didn't have any direct descendant. Uh, he only had daughters as well as illegitimate males. right? And some of them would also have an interesting future, but today I don't think we have time to recount it. In any case, um, uh, power was assumed by his nephew, Mastino II de la Scala, who extended the, the boundaries of the uh, seigniory much more far, as we will see now, up to Pontremoli uh, and on the Tyrrhenian Sea. So an area that de facto entered Tuscany, and from multiple sides, right, both from uh, the Romagnol area into the Apennine in Umbra and those places there, and um, the um, and literally the Toscomilian Apennine, the same from two different sides. So the it's difficult even to trace geographically, but still from a political point of view, the influence of the seigniory because it was so powerful that it virtually influenced any of the surrounding territories as well. So having to make, say, an army cross this this region was easier, right? And consider that they achieved that before, way before the Milanese would, right? A good 20 years before. Um, and also the fall of the, at least the, uh, the heavy blow received, as we'll see now, but it did last in the late 30s, would essentially allow Milan to expand the way we, we know, even in that case up to central Italy and even hoping to consolidate a sort of power over the entire Italic kingdom that however was not was not achieved. Um, in thirteen twenty eight the illegitimate sons of Cangrande attempted a conspiracy to kill the sons of Alboin uh, that were in fact Albert the Second and the same Mastino the Second, right? But they were discovered and imprisoned. Uh, on August the 8th, 1331, Mastino II was elected general captain of the league formed not only by Verona but also by the Este, um, the Gonzaga that at that point had been um, substituted to the Bonacolsi, uh, their leader Passerino being literally killed uh, by the Gonzaga, but that were armed and support by the by by Saint Cangrande. It was a kind of showdown because they had been allied, but oh my God, there is so much history we skip. But mm, okay, um, and the the same Visconti, right? Later, even Florence would join. Um, this league was created for the descent of John the Second of Bohemia in the Paul Valley, which was a, a strange event because he, w he was a Germanic leader of something. He was a the Luxembourg king of Bohem Bohemia, so rather a French dynasty in a Slavic country, but he embodied imperial power in some sort. Um, that paradoxically allied himself with the papacy to create a sort of shared power in Italy at the expense of all these seigneuries and, and communes. So that's why you have the strange couple of, say, Florence, Milan, Verona had basically not joined every other side because they, at least, yeah, okay, the, the Milanese and, and Veronese, yes, 
as imperial vikers for the imperial cause, but uh, it was they were still fighting for their own, and they hated each other gods. Um, and John of Bohemia had, by the way, just been called because Brescia had, if I'm not wrong, had asked uh, so for help from Verona. Uh, Brescia at that point didn't couldn't stand a chance against uh, the Scaliger power, and so had literally called John that entered with like it wasn't like a fairy tale story like with a few hundred a few hundred knights and the entire expedition was paid essentially by these lesser Italian communes that were trying to survive um, uh, from the onslaught of this massive lordship such as the De La Scala, the Visconti and so on and the plan failed naturally because there was nothing uh, constitutive even with papal support that could be achieved at that point and plus we're talking about a moment of great exhaustion of the continent, of the Po Valley, of this air that had, again, just come out of a series of prolonged warfare everywhere, right? After which the La Scala also had formed this massive dominion at the expense of free communes that had, as we've seen with Baldwin and others, that had just given up because they were too, too weak, practically. Um, and there was a consensus also towards this the, the, the seigneuries from a social point of view because at, at some point the people said I, I'm so exhausted I, I don't even want to defend my city anymore economically uh, it was like a bloodbath and also you know concretely but in order to avoid that in some circumstances people simply prefer to become subjects than something else this was this process of refeudalization as we've seen was present all over Europe and brought to the ancien regime as we know it with this very private seigneurial power essentially affirming everywhere in an oligarchic fashion um, on this occasion Massino II as we've seen was put at the head of the army ran to the aid of Ferrara that was posed under siege by the, um, the uh, papal legate the cardinal Bertrand de Pouget who was the Lord of Bologna that also had finally accepted kind of a senior because they were also another popular Guelph um, commune that didn't like those kind of things but it was terrible for them to control the uh, the district and they had to give an up in a way also because the Ghibellines all around were becoming too powerful and the battle was won this brought to the end of the um, of Bertrand de Puget senior in Bologna he came back to Provence where he was from um, and when Massino came back to Verona, he was acclaimed by, by the population as yet again a, a great lord. Subsequently, Massino subdued Bergamo, which is, as we've seen, like a step away from Mi Milan. Um, and this having passed Brescia and so on, so literally expanding even in, in Lombardy proper uh, and uh, controlling other cities as far as um, Parma, Lucca in Tuscany, Massa in, in Tuscany on, on the Tyrrhenian coast, Pontremoli. Uh, this penetration ha in Tuscany had been possible thanks to the exhaustion of the Ghibelline seigneuries there, especially Lucca in the northwest that con controlled at least part of the, 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 the Apenninic passes between the Po Valley and Tuscany. Um, and they simply bought the city because it had been so exhausted that uh, the only one around that could sus maintain uh, economically a, um, a garrison were the, the La Scala that simply occupied the place, started to fortify it, and so on. But they were somehow the products of political contingencies rather than some sound territorial domination. In fact, the end of the golden age of the De La Scala was with the same Mastino. He was, it's difficult to say whether he was ill-advised or whatever, but he began to annoy the Republic of Venice uh, by threatening the uh, salt mines near uh, Chioggia, right? Um, and this was a way essentially to, like, to 
to, to open a um, space to, to the sea because they said if we reach the Adriatic we have we can't even contain power from Venice isolated from from the interland and so kind of benefiting in, in the process because they are close at the end of the day but Venice had an enormous as you know political leverage thanks to her uh, trade and so on and so um, an anti scaliger league was formed between Florence and Venice basically um, they uh, Venice put the uh, money and Florence hired the troops that that's how it practically happened and uh, th there were some contingents from the same Florence the same Venice but they were mostly German mercenaries as a matter of fact in there was a war breaking out during which uh, the league was joined also by Milan, Mantua and Este because the, the La Scala, as we will see now, began to crumble. And the reason being that um, Venice could essentially field the troops, uh, the Venetians and the Florentines, because that's what the thing was, uh, right next to Verona, right, because Venice is closed. So what happened is that this war was not being fought on a the centralized frontier of this enormous sum of cities that as we've seen un were under the della scala rule but literally next to verona or to important core lands such as padua treviso that actually the allied raids r did reach verona the, the countryside of which was looted intensely um and milan naturally was pretty happy of this and they began even to contribute the same mantua because at that point the, the big the big uh, giant is disgregating so you want to take a piece of that uh, milan had been th there, there had almost been a cold war between milan and verona up to that point but now the tides were turning in favor of the milanese that were also expanding dramatically all over the war lasted like three four years and it was disastrous for verona because all these cities were lost and um, the, the, the Scaligers were forced to, to peace in 1339. Albert II was even taken prisoner. It was a disaster. And plus, uh, there were some interesting, um, say, outcomes. Because, first of all, the peace treaty involved the Emperor Ludwig the Bavarian that wanted to maintain control in the German mercenaries. But Florence said nuts because, you know, they had fought against... Ludwig and also the previous um, emperor so they, they said you have no business here it's it's a private business contract between us and Venice Venice was more like yeah okay but she literally didn't give a damn because like she just wanted to defend the, the south mines but didn't have like a real territorial interest yet even though that was the first time Florence kind of stepped into kind of um, thinking of say realizing she couldn't do any more without looking at what was happening on the immediate interland and she would keep expanding fast in some generations as you know even essentially following the same footsteps uh, of Verona against Milan in the west um, the veterans uh, of the war so the Venetian uh, Florentine um, mercenaries were not to be paid for by their employers so Mastino um, used them to um, to essentially uh, try a coup in Milan by supporting a Visconti exile that also fought the battle at Parabiago where Milan was about to be annihilated and if it was a bloodbath in the snow etc but Milan resisted also thanks to the allies and it went on um, actually pioneering further that model of thousands of m German mercenaries that had been employed by Florence and Venice in the same way so a very tough um, semi-permanent army sense that would eventually now swallow in the, the majority of the Po Valley and even permeating um, Tuscany in the process um, so you understand also the how Ludwig of Wittelsbach was interested in what was happening in Verona at the time that remained independent but lost de facto most of it, her power that was seized by others. Um, they had run out of resources, they were exhausted, they didn't have the power to recover and it was 
factually the end, right? Um, however, this was also the, the fact that Verona remained independent was merit of Mastino. It was deeply criticized for having waged war against Venice and all these things. But um, we can't even judge seriously the thing because if they had won in some way or in another, uh, the De La Scala were also fielding lots of troops, just the war lasted too long, right, and they ran out of money, literally. Um, so that was the main problem. Verona didn't have the same political and territorial base that Milan had in a direct control. They had lots of money, Mastino was the great uh, protector of the Germans, was the great lord, he was rumored to even aim at the crown of Lombardy. Uh, and thus of Italy, um, and to be this magnificent, hyper powerful, hyper knightly hero, right, that uh, was becoming uh, quasi emperor, right? But there was behind the De La Scala qu almost um, um, a, a paranoia not to be enough, especially compared to the Milanese, that probably was true, because again, Milan had instead a much more uniform way of expanding and had a much greater history and a much larger city since the beginning uh, than Verona had. So it's likely that the Scaligers always took, say, this step was longer their, than their leg because they knew that without doing that they would have probably sunk on the longer run. It, that's kind of what happened anyway. Um, Massino managed to retain control, not just of Verona, but also of Vicenza and Parma. Albine, this was lost to Azzo of Correggio, that was um, a local dynast, uh, at least was um, a magnate, we can't call, or lord better at this point, because there had already been a Correggio signory over Parma in the early days, and uh, Parma had been conquered brutally by by the the De La Scala that had squeezed her dramatically, uh, and uh, that exhausted the that that if you wonder where the resources came for maintaining the largest the second largest army in Europe after the Kingdom of France that De La Scala's one actually was we're talking about from five to six thousand men at arms uh, that were readily used right that's where it came from. Yeah, but the, the, when you understand it, even if you see it on a map, you realize how large it really was. Also, Luca was um, was maintained, telling the truth, but given that it was separated from the, importantly separated from the Veronese mainland and um, and the Apennine in between, etc., it was in, indefensible. Therefore, it was sold to Florence, and at least this triggered a war between Pisa and Florence, and actually Pisa won, as we've seen in the video about medieval Pisa recently. So an ambivalent situation was created with Mastino II, right? These, the, the super city government had collapsed, but still there was room for, for, other, um, for other political maneuvering, right? The, the city was defeated, the costs for the territorial downsizing uh, were very high. So there was, as a consequence, a discord between the influential families. Um, but at the same time, Verona maintained the reputation of a city refuge of the for the numerous exiles of the fratricidal struggles among Italians. First of all, because it was a clearly Ghibelline power, Secondly, because it was relatively more defiled from the core of the Po Valley and, and Tuscany. So, um, the, the La Scala, um, also thanks to the relationship with the House of Wittelsbach, became a sort of uh, imperial protectorate. These were the times in which the Scaligeri had less power than in the previous period, but despite of this, they had the strength to commission, for example, and finance the monuments that are mostly visible in Verona still today. 
the date for, to their time to this Castel Vecchio, the old, the old castle, the Scaliger Bridge, and especially the beautiful Scaliger Arcs that are among the top opological sources of the time, aside from the, the sheer beautiful art per se, and they date exactly to the time of Mastino, right? There is um, Can Grande, Mastino II, um, Can Signore, etc. There are um, interesting, um, like it was a bit the, the Italian style of the time, also the Visconti represented, for example, Bernabeu Visconti in the same way, and we will see that there was in fact a Milanese involvement, and probably also competition as far as the the arts of the, especially this, uh, this tombs fundamentally, really w w was. Um, Bastino II died in 1351. Interestingly enough, uh, he ruled on even after the the defeat. So, not everything was really lost, and this this is important to to stress because Bastino received an enormous amount of bad. We can say not press but manuscripting let's say at the time um, but he was also a capable ruler some people criticize can grant it because he sold like um, uh, some sort of resentment differences conflict within this enormous um, territory and he died before the, the thing could crack Right, so Massino found himself in that situation. He actually didn't handle it that bad. Um, so at that point, the seigniory of Verona passed to uh, Massino's sons, Can Grande II, Can Signorio, and Paul Alboin, while Albert II retired to private life and died shortly after. So a few, a few instances of someone uh, dying. Uh, uh, peacefully, right? This two Scaliger brothers, in spite of the, the major failure. Um, the first ruler, Can Grande II, was also known as Raging Dog, because um, he was the real ruler of the city. He behaved uh, in a sort of despotic fashion. At least this was the moment again of major contraction of um, of the medieval European civilization, um, there was a, a strong um, tyrannic consolidation in the neutral sense of the world. Um, as we've seen, this northern Italian princes were some of the most powerful. Um, Can Grande II amassed uh, an enormous wealth outside Verona for his illegitimate children. He tried essentially to form a kind of more dynastic es establishment. Um, this did cause resentment, which fueled internal strife until his death in 1359 at the hands of his brother, Cansignorio. Uh, the latter saw a more peaceful government. Verona at the time was embellished to the point of being nicknamed the Marmorina, that is to say, um, you know, well, the, the city of marble, some way, given the abundance of ancient marbles and Roman statues um, and also for uh, Cansignorio's building of, of a new masonry bridge over the Adige River, the Navi one. Um, and also the um, placement on a first clock on a tower in Italy, the Gardello Tower, um, moved by water mechanism, it's interestingly enough. Before his death uh, in 1375, Cansignorio ordered the death of his brother Alboin, though. This was done to guarantee the succession to his illegitimate sons Bartolomeo II and Antony, uh, that at the time were not of age yet, so would have surely exposed them to some, some uh, problem by, his, uh, by the, their, their uncle. Um, however, at this point, Verona's situation was mm, kind of internationally deteriorating. The two young princes entered a sort of protectorate of the Visconti. Um, Verona was deeply indebted also because of these um, buildings that were somehow necessary at the time again to compete with the other signories and also to 
to, to literally guard the cities. There is an impressive amount of fortification of the Italian city-states in this mid-14th um, century because the, the lords control the population better. Um, and the um, casus belli, if you want, because Bernabò Visconti, Lord of Milan, attacked Verona militarily, was the inheritance for his wife, Regina della Scala, that was sister of Cansignori. Um, thus, uh, you understand how properly there is a dynastic idea of the rights over the same, not even the same cities, but the signories altogether, right? The Visconti had married um, at the La Scala, and uh, he expected a sort of uh, inheritance from, from his wife at the succession. Um, the Veronese, however, managed to repel the Milanese with a sortie. Mm -hmm. So for six years, yet the city remained under the De La Scala. At this time, just to, you know, uh, soften up the thing, Antony had his brother Bartholomew II killed um, in order to be able to govern a lot, quite uh, simply put. Um, he also blamed the Malaspina, uh, the uh, Nogarola, that these were powerful families that uh, had gravitated around the De La Scala since an important amount of time. They were all important Ghibelline feudal military clans. Um, but uh, also the Bevilacqua family. And these were uh, exiled as a consequence, so it was just an excuse or they're not fully maybe aware of what uh, reality was behind this assassination, but in, in any case it was an important excuse to expel them and so to gain more power in the city. However, these families managed to find refuge in Milan that naturally exploited the situation. Uh, they, the, these people incited the Visconti to wage war against Verona. Thus a league was formed um, between an impressive amount of uh, lords that were the Visconti, the Carrara of Padua, the Este of Ferrara and the Gonzaga of Mantua. So all surrounding Verona in a way. Um, this host marked the end of the Scaliger lordship de facto. Uh, the Veronese actually fought uh, back two great battles. Before the definitive defeat in the Battle of Castagnaro, famous also for the participation of John Oakwood, is one of these quite in beautiful engagements also in this kind of uh, dismounted men-at-arms fashion and way and with long bows and um, uh, we will talk about John Oakwood in a some greater detail, right? But it was, uh, it, w it was very brutal and hard school and um, it illustrates also well, what kind of the uh, the Italian art of war plus the, this important foreign contributions really was. Um, thus, this ended not just the De La Scala mm, uh, lordship, but say the independence of Verona, de facto, as a city. Um, first of all, Antony de La Scala retired to Venice. He died um, in 1388 at Tredozio, from where he had left. Uh, with a small army for Verona. So naturally Venice at, at that point was starting to be annoyed already by the Milanese because um, uh, knocking out Verona basically put nothing between the Visconti and Venice herself. Um, this would, as you know, bring the Venetians to, thanks to this Veronese um, support, say the, the support to Verona at some by some degree, the De La Scala at least, to, um, to expand in, in the terra firma. The Visconti lordship on Verona began on October the 20th, 1388. It was pretty harsh. The Milanese had been developing a very kind of uniform, homogeneous administrative system for the time, based on the systematic um, exploitation of the local resources. Um, naturally, 
all calibrated to maintain uh, a steady control um, so much that even if the Veronese tried to oppose uh, the foreign domination this was in vain since the rebellions were put down in blood by the Visconti. Uh, Gian Galeazzo especially took care almost exclusively of strengthening his, uh, the city's defense walls um, and also the internal fortifications against the grower power of Venice and this kind of possible rebellions that could occur. It was typical the Visconti had they were kind of topping. Also the La Scala were, were, were doing it even earlier than them when they still had um, a large dominion but uh, the Visconti were the ones that systematized even this kind of military engineering in the northern Italian uh, cities. Um, so in the process the Veronese walls were restructured um, the castles of St. Peter and St. Felix were built and also a military citadel was created inside the city mm. so there was no way to de facto hope of, of making a coup successful unless you didn't have the entire Milanese garrison from your side um, the latter citadel was uh, an almost square shaped one protected by a dip pit and walls um, and there is a city quarter that still is named after it today uh, there was a revolt attempted in 1390 that broke down actually this system of fortifications because the Visconti troops were taken by surprise and withdrew there and it couldn't prevent the damage however reinforcements arrived and Verona was sacked for three days um, from June the 25th to the 27th uh, 1390. Three years after Gian Galeazzo Visconti ordered also a, a revision of the Veronese statutes and as a consequence the communal uh, militia was suppressed mm -hmm. this is another important step in the establishment of the of the Italian signories that they kind of begin to rely mostly on the condotte as you know and so with essentially financial means to hire uh, external mercenaries so to disarm the, the citizenry and uh, that had by the way already declined as a as a mills reforce because uh, the demographic and economic contraction had exhausted most infantries in Europe and so the refeudalization of the continent did pass as you know also through the reaffirmation an important degree of cavalry warfare which was something so ever more advanced technically and expensive by the way that uh, the average commoners could, couldn't even think to uh, to afford personally right uh, whereas in theory before they they could equip themselves in some way etc they could join this this mercenary forces but always somebody else's business in practice um, when Gian Galeazzo Visconti died in 1402 however um, and this was typical in the Milanese um, history like the, this frontier cities mostly could resume part of their own autonomy right because Milan extended far and wide in Italy but it had dynastic issues that brought thus you know if, if Milan was engulfed by a, a, a dynastic strife like they couldn't even go as far as say uh, Assisi that they also held to in the Umbrian mountains right to uh, obviously power banished in, in that sense and Verona in 1402 uh, was taken over by the Paduans by Fr Francis II of Carrara who tricked the Veronese in believing that he just wanted to put back William de la Scala son of Can Grande II in charge of the city and he even brought him there um, and helped the Veronese against the, the Milanese. William was actually even made lord and acclaimed by the people of Verona, except a few hours later <laughs> he was poisoned um, 
by the Carrara himself. Um, thus, um, the, um, uh, the, there were some other troubles because at least the sons of William were proclaimed lords by the Veronese, the Carrara had them arrested and seized power um, and uh, definitely the Carrarais weren't say that kind of powerful dynasty that could even afford now to impose so directly a control on Verona and in fact behind all this there was Venice in a way or another um, which taking advantage of the discontent of the Veronese um, decided to counter the Carrara putting him in, 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 in fight by the same Veronese people, right? And thus um, bringing Verona definitely under the Venetian protection of some sort. So much so that on June the 24th, 1405, the citizens of Verona sent a delegation of 40 people to the Most Serene Republic bringing the uh, Veronese insignia to the Doge of Venice, swearing an, alle uh, um, an allegiance to, to the Lagunar power. This was a kind of, uh, as you understand, a historical watershed, because at that point uh, it, it shows how Verona really didn't have any other uh, power base, like it could be possible like just in the previous century and um, this happened to many uh, Italian cities with uh, some very po had been very powerful one we've just seen it even for Pisa that actually resisted for very long and was kind of a formidable force but in this crisis uh, between the the second half of the 14th the beginning of the 15th century all these powers kind of were uh, taken over by the major centers, Florence, Milan, Venice, and that was basically it. There were just another few lordships worth of mention that um, could control other cities, right? Uh, but there were also somehow fringe and in between these ones. So um, uh, that's mostly what the uh, pre-unitary Italian states would remain, but... Um, in terms of effective power to single centers, albeit these signories and states that emerging from them were based still on the cities, right? Not on other systems, um, didn't have the possibility or the interest or of countering this this um, this dominion because it was just a way to survive kind of more hated domination. Surely for Verona it, it was much better to be under Venice than under Milan. Right, because w generally speaking, the Venetians had a more um, granted more autonomies. They were much more kind of uh, they were territorially aggressive, but still kind of respectful of some formal um, autonomy. Whereas the Milanese tried to intervene more successfully, by the way, uh, to 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 change that, to modify even the uh, say the customs kind of integrating everything under a more visible Milanese state that also for this reason was the most effective before the, the Italian wars um, in in the this episode episode of 1405 the prosecutor Gabriel Emos given the keys and seal of Verona with the banners of the commune that were placed in St. Mark Square by the Doge Michael Steno. Uh, and at the same time in Verona, the Carroccio of the city was paraded triumphantly throughout the city with the banner of the, of, of the Serenissima hoisted, which tells you what was the general spirit, at least where it was organized by Venetian agents or whatever, still the Veronese were somehow showing a clear sense of um, support, right, towards Venice as opposed to Milan. That was the main problem for them. Uh, on July the 16th of the same year, a golden, so-called golden bull sanctioned the, the privileges that the city would maintain under 
Venice um, that maintained two figures there that were Venetians themselves, the Podesta, that at this point had uh, lost military f functions, just just had civil ones, and the captain instead that was instead in fact the, the military commander. Um, because Venice was trying to, to simplify the thing, also to just have a general command on his own and just a civil administration on his own, doing two different things at two different levels, coordinating with the rest, especially the military one, of, of the Serenissima domains. Um, there was, however, a, another attempt from the Della Scala to recover Verona, led by Brunoro Della Scala, so, this, this still shows a bit of romanticism from the side of the Veronese uh, that attempted a rebellion. This was, however, repressed. Um, it was not even possible to Brunoro to penetrate the walls. Um, and he actually had tried multiple times to get in the city, but uh, again, but he had always failed. So, that tells you also the degree of, let's say, like in the early 14th century still making a coup would have been easier than than this instead now there was properly a more scientific control of the population of the of the fortresses the, the venetians had inherited the, all the milanese ones built in the city as well um, so it's obvious that there was a sort of veronese pride attached to the scaliger memory it goes without saying but the practicability of a Scaliger ring statement in, in the Renaissance now was kind of anachronistic. In any case, Verona uh, was um, involved in the wars naturally between Venice and Milan, especially in 1438, where the Veronese district was blooded by the, the two armies. And there was um, even a um, honorably mentioned uh, military episode that is the passage of a fleet made up of six galleys and 25 other ships um, uh, through the um, the reach of M Mount Baldo through the Lopio Pass uh, essentially th the fleet went up to the Adige and almost reached um, Rovereto towards the mountains to be transported up to the to Lake Garda by land, um, pulled by 2,000 oxen. Uh, it took two weeks to accomplish this, and it's known as the episode of Galeas per Montes, so the galleys through the mountains. Uh, the fleet was used by the Venetians in the Garda Lake to counter the Milanese fleet, right? And uh, it won a battle near Riva del Garda which forced the the fortress to capitulate by the way so it was an impressive feat that the Venetians from their amphibious background knew perhaps better how how to accomplish but that's kind of how Renaissance warfare was transforming itself this however could not prevent Verona from being stormed on November the 16th of, of the same year in fact the walls of the citadel were scaled and the gates of the cities broke down by the Milanese who began to loot the city. The Venetian Podesta and captain found refuge in St. Peter's Castle and in St. Felix Castle. From there the Venetian garrison asked Venice for support and troops arrived in fact within four days. They entered from uh, the north uh, of the city from St. Felix uh, and managed to repel the Milanese troops uh, who crowded near the new bridge looking for an escape route. Um, and as it happened in some of these events where lots of people were in masts or medieval bridges, uh, the structure could not hold the weight of the soldiers. So the bridge collapsed many Milanese drowned in the waters of the Adige, while as many as 2,000 were captured. So this was a, uh, an impactful blow. Um, Verona was completely 
liberated of the following year, 1439, when a piece was stipulated contemplating uh, Pesquera and Legnago to be returned by the Milanese to the province of Verona for how it had remained as a city district in the now under the Venetian uh, control. Right. What is fascinating is that uh, Venice, as you know, was not part of the Holy Roman Empire, but as she began to structure the impressive, like, um, in fact, uh, northern Italian uh, possession that was like two-thirds of northern Italy, and so Milan was freaking out. The whole thing was designed to, to counter Milanese expansion, and the Venetians for the first time open to that kind of terrestrial policy, but they were technically invading the Holy Roman Empire, right? So, of course, uh, the thing was done by saying, okay, the Veronese wanted me to be their lord, so this is legal, um, and if the emperor also can't do anything about it, it's... The, but Venice was also administering these lands in also kind of an intensive way, so that it was essentially creating a state there. Um, and in fact, the first Venetian century in Verona was also rich in construction of church monuments. Um, there was, for example, the, the presence of the monk John of, of Verona and the Olivetans of Saint Mary in, in Organ, and that brought the the press to Verona, right? Um, and um, so we are uh, the threshold of modern age and of a period that uh, would even make a the Venetian Republic was a quite important intellectual center as it had already been, but think about the same Padua, uh, etc. Um, so, with the end of the war of in 1439, actually Verona even enjoyed a, a peaceful time that allowed these improvements to take place, um, and war would break out only in 1501 again, at the time of the War of the Lake of Cambrai, when many European powers attacked uh, Venice and her territories. But that's another story and surpassing. Like we started with 1201 and we end with 1501 um, for the Middle Ages. Um, there is always more to say about these polities because they uh, say in the details that you could understand even just by the Scaliger dynasty uh, and scenery like that are worth being discussed in so many different videos that we probably will right uh, some months ago I made a video about the the Visconti and the, the Venice lordships that included the La Scala but we never talk about the La Scala per se which is kind of disturbing in I think at this point like 1600 videos so I think um, this is all information that we can use profitably um, also uh, in fact as an introduction when I say a very short introduction is because literally um, this is not even sh very short this is practically an introduction to the limit of rarefaction and it doesn't have practically any other purpose than saying okay I made a basic video about this topic so that later I can start talking more in depth by making people know more or less what we're talking about but even these single events are crucial to be framed correctly because they're, they're very complex right if you learn these histories from general summaries or so on you you will not know the the hardcore details of it all right you will not especially I presume with this um, especially in the case of the Italian city-states, it, it, it's all the, say the power is more difficultly visible because more or less you see France and you have an idea, of, at least independently from the the actual power of the monarchy within it. Say, okay, at least this was France by a certain time and it had a more or less unitary policy. But when you look at thirty city-states all close together and you you don't can you you don't know that the history of the single city-states and you don't know how they actually interacted with each other which is the most by far the most complicated thing to find because you f can easily find a history of Verona but what about how they interacted with the other cities yes you can find it in the let's say in, in 
in function of, of, of the Veronese perspective, let's say, but what about the wall one, the essential one? I know people today are obsessed with perspectives because they think that they can uh, paranoidly shrink their brains just to, to, to reduce to the minimum to their uh, kind of um, made up superheroes, whatever fact just that politics allegedly just concerned about but if you don't understand the context even in an essential way like and which can mean also already a pretty complex one how can you even appreciate a polity of this kind and that's why probably nobody makes videos about this stuff because you say Verona and for a for a medievalist everybody knows the importance of this city but as a also with the La Scala the even the role in the empire uh, and today we skipped so much, so you can understand how much can be said and, uh, you know, reviewed, and this will hopefully continue uh, to some other point. But again, step by step, right, it's important and it's useful, and the more we talk about this stuff, the better. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.